And good evening, everyone. Uh, Going to walk through uh, regression or data screening for regression <clears throat> in Stata in this video. Uh, I apologize for the quality of the sound. Uh, my mic crapped out, so it sounds like I'm coming from the bottom of the ocean, but uh, this will work for our purposes, I guess, at least uh, in the short term. Um, so what we're going to do is work through full screening uh, for some sample regression. Um, the sheet that we're going to be working on from class is this uh, PDF here, um, the standard multiple regression screening, and the data set that we're going to be using is the Psych 3, uh, 5300 uh, exercise, the regression uh, stuff here. So in this hypothetical example, uh, what we're looking at is we've got our outcome variable here that we're predicting is going to be a measure of role functioning. Uh, so this is looking at just day to day functioning among a sample of motor vehicle accident survivors uh, where higher scores ranging from zero to 100 higher scores indicating greater functioning. Um, and our predictors in this model are going to be uh, continuous PTSD symptom severity, uh, an indicator of continuous pain uh, with higher levels being uh, more severe pain. And then we've got an indicator variable, a dichotomous variable, uh, yes, no, uh, indicating uh, the use of opiate medication okay, for pain management. So uh, this is the set we'll be, or the she will be working with, so make sure that you have that open as you're working through or, or walking with me through this uh, example. So uh, here in SETA, uh, we have our uh, main window open here. These are our data, participant number, uh, pain variable, opiate, PTSD, uh, and our outcome role functioning. Um, I'm going to be working mostly today uh, with through the do file. Uh, so all the commands will be listed here so that you can see. Um, we could type them into the command prompt, but this is just going to be faster and have everything set up. So um, first thing that we're going to do uh, in terms of wanting to get a sense for what uh, cases have full data for my uh, analysis that I want to run. So here I'm going to use all of my variables in this analysis. I've got a, uh, an outcome variable and three predictors. And so what I'm going to do in state of you can do this uh, pretty easily. What I'm going to do is I'm going to regression, run a regression model. Uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, enter reg role functioning, which is my outcome, and then my three predictors here. Um, so I'm going to go through and I'm going to run that. And this is going to give me a regression model, but I don't really care about that because what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell Stata to generate a variable called check, and I want the variable to equal one if the case in the data was used uh, in this sample. So this eSample uh, command, what this will do is it's going to create a new variable, and if the case was included in my regression analysis, it'll go through and uh, give that a marker there. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to hit that. And if I go to my uh, uh, data sheet here, I can say I've got a new variable named check with uh, a one if all my variables in my model are present. Okay, um, and if I go through and I sort by check, didn't do anything because it looks like I have full data in this set. Okay, um, but then what I could do is if I could, if I had something missing, I could drop it here. So I guess. Uh, just as a quick example, let's say um, say we're missing a variable for this uh, pain variable here, and let's say we're missing uh, PTSD here. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of that check variable. I'm going to run this again. Okay, so I'm going to go through uh, that first analysis. Uh, that first regression model included all 201 variables in the set. But if I go through and I rerun that model. Now we just have uh, 198 people in this set, okay? And this time, when I run the uh, create my variable, if it was in, if I go through and I run that, now I have a check variable, right? But it looks like this one has a missing value because case 105 wasn't included because it was missing pain. Uh, same thing, case 120 wasn't included in my model. Uh, because it was missing a variable for PT, a value for PTSD. So that way, if I then sort by my check variable, 
I go down to the bottom and I can say, oh, okay, these are two cases in this set that were missing data, okay? Um, and then if I go through and I just run drop, if check equals one, remember that Stata uh, treats missing values as infinitely large, so these missing values are going to be a billion billions, and so that's greater than one, and so if I just hit drop, it'll just get rid of those. So uh, when you're running uh, larger sets, uh, where you're going to have a variety of maybe a, a number of predictors or a variety of missing values, um, this is a nice way to just go through and identify cases with full data, and then you can go through and if you're missing uh, cases with missing values, you can go through and just record uh, what they are. So, um, but we don't want to do that, uh, have this set. So I'm just going to type in clear. It's going to get rid of all my data, not save anything. And then I'm just going to go back up to uh, my, in my command prompt, where I had originally called these data in. And now we're back to my original set with a full 201. Okay. So, going to run through that. Uh, there we go. So we've got full data here, not missing any values. So we want to make note of that on my screen that we have full values here. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do now, uh, remember that my I've got three predictors in this uh, hypothetical model. I've got two continuous predictors, PTSD and pain, and then I've got a dichotomous predictor for uh, opiate use. So what I want to go through is I want to take a look at my uh, distributions for both my predictors and my outcome. Uh, what we're going to do is look at plausibility and then uh, univariate distribution skew kurtosis stuff. So uh, what I'm going to do is first I'm just going to pick out my categorical variable. Remember this is opiate use, yes, no. And so just using the free command here, run that. I can see that I've got a pretty even split in these data. So about half of my uh, sample using uh, opiate pain medication, uh, about the other half not. So uh, this is good. I uh, don't have any weird uh, unbalanced splits. Um, so I am excited about that. So opiate use looks pretty good. Again, zero, one, no out of bound values. Uh, so pretty happy with that. Uh, now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a look at my descriptive statistics for uh, my continuous variables. Here I've got role functioning, pain, and PTSD. Um, and what I'm going to do, just because I like the format a little bit better, I like the tab stat. Um, that's going to just order things up uh, nicely. And so I'm going to get statistics for role functioning, pain, PTSD. And then the statistics that I'm going to ask for are uh, sample size, mean, standard deviation, min, max, skew kurtosis. Okay. I'm going to go through and run that. And here I see that... My sample size is all the same. I knew that because I went through and checked for missingness. Uh, my min and my max, 0 to 100. Let's see here. Oh, well. Squeeze in on that. Okay. So I've got uh, my roll functioning, 0 to 100. That's within bounds. Pain, 0 to 6. That's within bounds. PTSD, 0 to 111. That's within bounds. Uh, so my uh, continuous variables, all plausible, and so uh, that's good. So I don't have any strange values that uh, are uh, don't, don't make sense given the scale, okay? Um, but now if I go down through and I take a look at skew, it's for pain and PTSD, things are looking okay, uh, but I do have some notable skew in my role functioning variable, and then again, if I go down through and I take a look at... Uh, my kurtosis value, remember that uh, neutral kurtosis in Stata has a value equal to 3. Uh, so if we were using like SPSS or something along those lines, uh, both of these are perfectly fine in terms of kurtosis. These are almost uh, perfectly neutral in terms of their kurtosis value. Uh, if we wanted to, we just subtract 3 if we wanted to make something comparable to SPSS. So that would be a value of 0 0.06 and 0 0.11. So we're good there. But... Uh, when I take a look at my role functioning variable, so I have some pretty pos uh, significant uh, positive skew, um, and then I also have uh, some uh, fairly serious kurtosis here. So again, if we subtract three, that gives me a value of uh, 4.03 for my kurtosis. Uh, generally, what we're looking at is anything less than two. So we have some concerns, and I want to make note of that. 
as I'm keeping track of things, that I looks like I do have some problems, maybe in terms of the distribution of my, uh, of my role functioning variable, my outcome. Okay, so want to record skewing kurtosis values um, here, uh, but then what I'm going to do is I want to go through and I want to take a look at these graphically. So my first graph uh, is going to be a we're going to request a two-way graph, so we're going to combine a couple of different graphs here. Um, and what I'm first, I'm going to combine, overlay these two. Uh, my first graph will be a histogram of role functioning. Now, if I actually look at uh, the values for role functioning, if I go sort role functioning, I'll see that role functioning actually, it's 0 to 100 but it actually takes on ordinal values. So it's only actually has four values, 0, 25, 50, 75, and 100. Um, well, here are five values there. Uh, and that's going to be problematic. And so what I'm going to do for my histogram is I'm going to specify that the, to treat these data as discrete because they're categorical for my histogram. Then I'm going to ask for a kernel density plot. Um, this is going to uh, go through and uh, plot a, a smooth line based on the data. This will give me a sense for uh, sort of a normal curve type of thing and how far I have deviations. And then what I'm going to do here, uh, just so that we can have multiple uh, graphs up on the screen, I'm going to name this uh, first two-way plot. Uh, I'm going to give it a name H1 and then going to specify replace so I can keep running it again and again if I want. If we don't name it, Every time I go through and run a new uh, graph, it'll replace those. So the name is just to go through and help uh, so I can have multiple things on the screen at once. So I'm going to go through and run this. Maybe. There we go. Okay. So some pretty severe positive skew uh, in these data. Okay. Um, so we see that mostly everybody has very, very low levels of functioning here at zero. Uh, and then we have people going through and reporting uh, some higher levels of functioning here. So clear problems in terms of the distribution of my outcome variable, which causes me some concern. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do now, so I'm going to take note of that, uh, but then I'm going to do the same thing, request a histogram for uh, my pain variable. And what I'm going to do here. Uh, same type of thing. So I've got my two way. So I'm going to overlap a couple of graphs. So I've got histogram for pain. Um, and then instead of just letting uh, Stata do whatever it wants to do, I'm going to tell it how many bins to use for this continuous variable. Um, and rule of thumb that I like to use is the square root of, uh, of the sample size plus three. So if I go to and use uh, Excel as my calculator, I hit display uh, square root of 201 plus 3. And so you can just use this as a calculator. Uh, so 201 square root of that plus 3 is going to be about 17. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell Stata to uh, organize my histogram in 17 different bins. And this generally turns out uh, looking uh, reasonable in terms of graphs. Going to uh, request kernel density uh, function uh, for pain, and then I'm just going to name this something else so I can have these two graphs up together. Okay, so here's my graph for pain. So again, here's role functioning uh, with a kernel density plot. Uh, here have some negative skew clearly with uh, my pain variable, um, but Again, if I go through and take a look at my distributions, I can see the negative skew there. Uh, kurtosis is about uh, neutral. So I want to note that I do have some negative skew here, but maybe not something I'm going to be too concerned about uh, with a sample of this size. Okay. Um, finally, I'm going to go through, let's do the same thing, request a, a plot histogram for PTSD. That looks beautiful. Really like that. Um, put that up side by side with my other plots that's less beautiful but still probably acceptable uh, this looks gorgeous um, so based on my uh, histograms thinking that probably have a problem with uh, role functioning here 
uh, but uh, pain and PTSD are looking okay. All right. Uh, also want to look at some box plots. Box plots are nice because box plots are going to be the same no matter what program you're using to estimate those. So here we're going to uh, request a box plot for row functioning. And here is just some uh, specifications to try and increase the interpretability of this. Uh, marker type 1, uh, marker size is going to be small, and then I'm just going to name this uh, so that I can have it up. Okay. Run my box plot. That's a pretty terrible looking box plot. Okay, looks like my uh, my median, my first quarter, my first quartile, my third quartile are all zero, and then all of these variables coming up again. You can see one, two, three, four. This is going to be zero, twenty-five, fifty, seventy-five, a hundred. Again, reflecting the ordinal nature of these data. Okay, so that doesn't look too great. Um, but if I go through and I look at box plot for Pain severity, again, what we've done here uh, is, again, uh, looking at a box plot for pain. Um, again, marker variable, looking at very small marker sizes. Um, so we get small, very small, tiny, just playing around with this so that you can see. Um, here, I've also uh, given a marker label as my participant variable, which is subject. Remember that state is case sensitive, subject is uh, lowercase. Uh, and so telling it to label uh, markers by subject and then have a uh, label this B2. So if I go through and take a look here, I see I have a median value of a little over four. Um, uh, max value, minimum value still within one and a half times the interquartile range. And then I've got a value of 202 that looks like to be the most extreme, but then uh, some values here. Um, that are extending beyond one and a half times in a quartile range. Uh, and if I want to make sure that I know what those are, I can just go sort pain. And you can see, so it looks like uh, yeah, some of these values here. Okay. So uh, looking at pain, uh, pain doesn't look too bad. Uh, and if I go to PTSD, got PTSD with one case, 221, uh, falling above the inner, uh, one and a half times the interquartile range, but this is looking pretty good. Okay. So, uh, this is going through taking a look at, uh, my predictors in my continuous outcome within this set. The only case that I'm really, or the only variable I'm probably concerned with here uh, is going to be my role functioning, okay? Uh, again, that's probably not going to be great in terms of an outcome. So what I might want to do is I might want to uh, maybe transform this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell Stata to generate a new variable, natural log of role, it's going to be the natural log of my role functioning variable plus one. Remember that role functioning, there's a lot of zeros. I can't take the log of zero, uh, so I'll just add one to make the uh, smallest value uh, a value of one. And uh, we'll go through and run this transform variable. So I'm going to run log transform of my role functioning variable. Okay. And if I look, so now I've got natural log of uh, role functioning here, um, and then if I go through, and here I'm just going to request uh, summarize the, my newly transformed natural log of role, and here I'm just going to use the sum, the, the sum command, the summary command, and I'm going to specify detail, a little bit different than the tab stat we did, but just it's easy and convenient just because I have one variable here. So if I go through and I take a look, uh, this is a summary statistics for role functioning. Uh, here I see that now that my skew has gone from let's skew up here. Oops. My skew was 2.25. Skew my uh, uh, transform variable is now 1.4. So we've gotten that down into something that's a little more reasonable. My kurtosis here was a value of 4.03. Again, remember that we subtract three from the kurtosis values, uh, which is too much here. Uh, my kurtosis is now 
0.20. So kurtosis is much better. So this transform variable is looking a lot better than what we had had up here for our outcome. Okay. But if we go down through, and so that's looking better in terms of the descriptive statistics, but I'm going to go through and take another look. And so I'm going to request a histogram of role functioning, kernel density. Okay. So it still looks pretty bad, right? Um, if I go through, oops, take a look. So this is the untransformed variable. This is the transformed variable. My statistics on this relative to this are better. Uh, the natural log transform kind of pulls things in, but again, it's not going to make this not a discrete variable, right? I have five values. Uh, one, two, three, four. Yeah, I have five values here. It's the same thing here. It hasn't changed that at all. Um, well, I've got four values, but that's just SPSS's binning. I can go through and uh, just specify that I want uh, this to be discrete and then rerun that. There we go. Okay, so it brought things in, but it's still not great. Um, so better than when we're, where we were, uh, but still something that we're going to keep in mind that essentially what we're doing is even though we've got a variable in the raw form running from 0 to 100, at the end of the day, it's an ordered categorical variable uh, that has a pr uh, the far more values at 0. Um, we're going to ignore this for right now, but we'll see some weird stuff coming up uh, at the end of the day as a preview for these type of data with this type of outcome. You'd actually probably want to use a different model, not a standard regression. But we'll ignore that for right now uh, and move on through. Uh, so we've got, oh, and then if we go through and we take a look at a box plot or here, box plot still looks about the same. It pulls everything in a little bit. But so we've got some problems with our with our outcome variable here. Okay, uh, so that's going to be a limitation of this model if this were something we're actually going to run. Okay. So we've got, uh, this takes care of our univariate dis uh, distributions, and this is stuff that you've done before. Uh, nothing hugely new here. But after we've gone through and taken a look at uh, things we have issues with, I uh, want to look at univariate outliers. So remember, univariate outliers are extreme values. Uh, in univariate distributions, we're just going to request z-scores. So I'm just going to say, uh, tell uh, state a z-score for role functioning, pain, and PTSD. We don't have to create a z-score for our dichotomous variable, because that doesn't make any sense. Um, so I'm going to go z-score for my three variables here. Tell me that it's gone through and created that. And then if I look at my uh, data set, I can see that I now have z-scores for role functioning, pain, and PTSD. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to summarize uh, the z-score for the natural log of role functioning through uh, z-score for PTSD. That's just catching all three of these. I run that. And here uh, I'm going to be interested in the min and the max value. Okay. Remember, uh, this is state is a little bit different. It's far more precise than SPSS. SPSS would just put zeros here. These are functionally zeros. This is a 3.87 times. Uh, 10 to the negative 17th, that's zero. What we're interested in here uh, are the min and the max. Uh, so for uh, my transformed role functioning variable, uh, I've got a, a value that's, or a case that's about a little over two, two standard deviations above the mean, uh, but that seems reasonable. Here we've got a low z-score of negative three, so we've got a case uh, on pain that's about three standard deviations below the mean. Um, that's, you know, for thinking about things that start to catch our eye, it's things that hit above 3.2933, that's conventional, or uh, z-scores that would be associated with p equal 0.001, rough rule of thumb, but again, we've also had 201 uh, cases, so we've got a large set, we're going to expect some extreme values, so probably not too concerned about that here, uh, and then finally for our PTSD variable, uh, have z-scores ranging from negative 2.6 to a little over 3. Again, uh, that 3 value is large, but 
in a larger sample, I'm not surprised that I'm going to have some people who are uh, scoring quite high above the mean relative to PTSD, and so uh, not too concerned about this. Okay, so uh, univariate outliers are pretty good, uh, and again, this is stuff that you've already done before, uh, so nothing too radical there, right? But now, what we want to do, you want to take a look at our uh, linearity and homoscedasticity uh, in our bivariate uh, plots. So what we're going to do, uh, and again, what we want to see is in a bivariate scatter plot, we want to see that our variables are uh, re linearly related, uh, so we don't have nonlinearity in our uh, uh, in our bivariate relationships, and we also want to see that the spread of our scores across the uh, uh, range of the x-axis with y's that everything we won't have any fan shapes or anything like that that would indicate heteroscedasticity. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell uh, say to degenerate uh, a scatter plot matrix, so graph matrix, uh, and include natural log of role functioning, opiate PTSD, or opiate use, pain, and PTSD. Okay. Now, with uh, opiate use, this is a dichotomous variable, um, and so uh, relations between continuous dichotomous variables can't be uh, can't be um, Nonlinear, but what we can do is we can look at uh, homoscedasticity in that. Okay, so again, uh, a scatter plot matrix with natural log of role functioning, opiate use, pain, PTSD, marker size. We're going to say tiny, and then uh, giving this a name here. So we're going to run through, take a look at that. Okay, so what we've got is a nice matrix uh, that gives us all of our uh, variables here. Um, the way this is set up, if we look in this upper quadrant, we have uh, role functioning here in the uh, y-axis, uh, and then opiate use, uh, pain severity, PTSD in the uh, in the x, right? And so here, if we're looking at this, not seeing anything that looks too much that would indicate not any nonlinearity, or uh, anything that would look like um, too bad in terms of heteroscedasticity. Uh, now again, for anything with opiate use, right, there's going to be these variables here, these variables here, these are zero ones. What you can do is start to see spread to see if you've had very like a very, uh, let's say for no opiate use, very uh, little variability here and a lot of variability here. But doesn't look like we're seeing that. The one thing that I don't like about this graph uh, is again because with role functioning, we only have five values here, and so everything kind of lines up in straight lines. One of the things we can do in Stata is we can add an option. Uh, see, I got this jitter. What this is going to do is it's going to add just a little bit of tweaking when it's plotting this out, uh, so that here, this is. 150 cases are all identified by this one dot because they're all stacked up on top of one another because it's all the same value. Um, what we can do is we can rest, request uh, that SP, or that Stata add some jitter, and it's just going to give us a better sense for, uh, it's going to move those around so that they're just not all stacked up on top of one another. Um, so if I go through and I run that, and if we look at these two graphs, we can see, so what it's done is it's gone through and add some a little bit of variability around those dots so that they're just not all one on top of one another. So I can see a little bit there. Um, we could go through and say I want to increase that jitter by two. I reran that. Now it's sort of moved around a lot, right? Um, here it doesn't make too much of a difference. Um, I'll go through back and change it back to one. This is just a preference in terms of uh, what you want your graphs to look like, but this just makes everything so it's not stacked up on top of each other. It's a more effective graph than this. So, uh, as I'm looking here, not seeing anything uh, that looks too terribly uh, problematic in terms of linearity or violations of homogeneity or, uh, excuse me, linearity or heteroscedasticity. 
Uh, but let's say that mm, if we were concerned maybe with, let's say this uh, quadrant down here, we'd see at high levels, again, here, whoops, here we're going to have role functioning, the natural log of role functioning on the uh, x-axis. PTSD total score is the y. And so maybe we say, boy, it looks like there's a lot less variability in PTSD total score uh, at high levels of role functioning versus lots of variability at low levels of role, role functioning. What I want to do is I want to look more closely at that uh, graph there to see what's going on. So if I want to do that, I can just uh, request a scatter plot. And again, this is just a two-way graph. So we're going to superimpose a couple of different uh, uh, graphs here. So I'm going to request a scatter plot of PTSD, and I want it to make it look like this. So PTSD on the y-axis, natural log of role functioning on the x-axis. So I wanted to just replicate that. Um, I'm going to tell it to give me a little bit of a jitter, a uh, small, very small sample or a very small marker size. And then I'm going to request a Lois line. Okay, a Lois is a smooth fit uh, that we'll go through and take a look at the data. We'll use this to see if we have any nonlinearities. If we have weird kind of funky nonlinearity stuff, that Lois uh, line will maybe pick that up. And then I want a linear fit of PTSD and role functioning. So again, these are pretty easy once you got this uh, command down. You just take PTSD role functioning, and you're just running the same graph for the Lois and the linear fit here. So if we go through and we run that, we we'll see what we get is a close-up uh, of this specific scatter plot here. So again, lots of variability in uh, PTSD symptom severity at uh, low levels of role functioning, less variability at high. But remember that what we're looking for in terms of problems with heteroscedasticity is going to be a spread that's three times the largest versus the smallest spread. So at the highest end, we've got about a sort of range of 50. At the or at the high end of uh, role function, we've got a spread of 50. At the low end, we've got a spread of a little over 100. It's kind of two to one, so we're not too concerned here. We see this green line. This is my linear, uh, my fit line, my linear fit line here, um, and then this red line is my lowest, and it's tracking pretty close to that uh, linear fit line. Uh, so we're, everything's looking pretty good there. Okay, so uh, as I'm going through. In terms of looking at linearity, homoscedasticity uh, in my bivariate plots, remember that uh, we have a violation of uh, the fixed effects assumption of regression, uh, which is problem uh, not a problem, doesn't bias our estimates so long as our vari variables are normal and uh, linearly related and homoscedastic. Um, role functioning isn't normal. It's sort of the but at least we don't have any problems, it looks like, based on our bivariate plots with uh, heteroscedasticity or nonlinearity. Okay. okay, so to this point, we've worked through everything that we can do with our bivariate relations. What we want to do now is start to go through and take a look at our residuals. This is really where uh, the assumptions of our regression models uh, start to uh, become important. All the stuff we went through in class uh, in terms of multivariate outliers, residual plots, and things like that, this is where we're going to take a look at this. Okay, So what we're going to do is first request a regression line. And this is just having a state or run a regression, uh, regressing uh, the natural log of role functioning onto opiate use, pain, and PTSD. Okay, This is our model that we want to run. Again, we're not worried too much about uh, the actual coefficients at this point. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have uh, Stata run this, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to have it uh, save a number of different uh, statistics based on this model. Okay, um, So if we go through and pop up your handout, we'll see that uh, things I'm uh, going to be requesting here I'm going to have it run the model, but then I want it to predict and save as the variable name y hat uh, xb. xb is going to be our predicted or expected values of y. 
So I'm going to tell Stata to save, give me a new variable called y hat that saves my predicted values. So based on this model, what are the predicted values for role functioning? Uh, that's what I'm going to get there. Uh, then I'm going to also tell it to save a variable called resid. This is r. r is just your raw residual. This is your observed score minus your expected score. Okay. I'm also going to have it uh, save a variable called tres. This is my r student. Uh, this is my externally studentized, externally studentized residual that we had talked about uh, in class, so it's going to save that. Then I'm going to have it save uh, uh, a variable called lev. This is going to be my leverages. Uh, save a variable called cooks. This is my cooks d. Um, and then cove ratio. We're not going to play around with that a whole lot in this uh, example, but I'm going to tell it to save that. Okay. So again, this part of your data is not going to change in any regression screening you do. Uh, all you're going to need to do when you go through and do your own is just modify this and uh, Stata will do the rest. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this whole thing. So, well, here we'll do this. First, run my regression model. Okay. Here's my regression model. Don't care about that quite yet. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to have it predict all these variables here or uh, write in all these variables. And if I run that, what I'll see here is I've got a bunch of new variables in my set. Uh, I've saved my y hat, that's my expected value of y, uh, my raw residual, my externally studentized residual, leverage, cooks, and co ratio all there. So uh, I've got these for every uh, value in the set. So this is looking pretty good. Okay. So what I'm first going to do is I want to take a look at the distribution of my residuals. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to request a graph, uh, again a uh, two-way, so I'm going to request a scatter plot, uh, plotting my residuals, my raw residuals on my uh, y-axis, uh, my y-hat, my predicted values on the x, um, and I'm going to tell it to give me a reference line at zero, right? Remember that my residuals should be normally distributed uh, around uh, that zero point, um, so they should have a normal distri distribution. They should be evenly distributed, right? Um, again, I'm also going to ask for a lowest uh, line that's going to go through and give me, uh, see if I have any nonlinearities in my residuals. That's going to be important, uh, telling me maybe I have a model misspecification, something along those lines. And then I'm just going to give it a, uh, a name so that I can have most of the uh, multiple things up there, okay? So if I go through and I run this, all right, this looks really weird, right? What I've got is my predicted values of y against the residuals for y, okay? And what we'll see very clearly here is we've got things kind of running in three lines, okay? Reason that is, is because our uh, outcome variable, even our, uh, even after the, um, uh, even after the transform, Remember that I've only got four or five values of my outcome. And so what ends up happening then is we get a plot that looks kind of like this, not the big cloud that we'd kind of look want, uh, but we've got values, predicted values here uh, for low, high, higher, high. And so we get kind of this uh, straight sloping line thing. So that's not great. And again, what this is saying is that our outcome variable isn't great. We also see what kind of looks like a curvature of that lowest line. You know, that's just more of a function of uh, this, the problematic distribution of my outcome. Um, but so again, one is say that uh, because the distribution or the level of measurement of my outcome variable has kind of thrown off my thrown off my residual plot a little bit. Okay, but. I don't know that I'd take that lowest line too seriously. I don't know that I have any uh, strong evidence for nonlinearity here. Um, mostly this is just a measurement issue. I'm interpreting it anyway. Um, also want to think about uh, distributions, right? Now normally what we would say is here at the low end, we've got very, very little variability in terms of my outcome. And then here we've got a whole lot of variability and then here we've got very little variability. Again, under normal circumstances, we would uh, identify that as a 
maybe a, a possible issue of uh, of heteroscedasticity, violation of homoscedasticity. Uh, but again, what we're dealing with is an outcome variable that's uh, ordinal in nature. Uh, and so we're going to take this with a with a grain of salt here. So um, some problems with my uh, residual uh, plot, but again, I'm going to interpret this as primarily an issue with uh, the measurement of my outcome variable. Yeah. Um, also, what are we going to do? So this here, we're looking at linearity and um, heteroscedasticity of my residuals. Uh, what I can also do, or what I'm also going to do, is I'm going to get a, a, a box plot uh, of my uh, what am I? Oh, whoops! I'm looking at the wrong thing. Sorry about that. Yeah, I was like, that doesn't make sense. Okay, so this is going to give me my graph here. It's going to give me my residuals, uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to request, as we talked about, uh, a normative. This is going to be uh, requesting a PP plot. Okay, and what I'm interested in here is whether or not uh, the distribution of my residuals are relatively normal. Remember that with our norm, uh, uh, normal probability plots, uh, if we were plotting a variable that has a normal, uh, uh, that uh, meets a normal distribution, it should uh, fall right along this diagonal axis. Uh, the PP plot here has some deviations, right? Um, but they're not too terribly bad. I don't know if I'm too worried about normality with this. What I can also do is I can also go through and uh, request just a histogram of my residuals. Um, and if I go through and I do that, so I've got a two-way histogram for residuals, uh, kernel density uh, plot here. If I go through and I do that, this is what it gives me in terms of my uh, distribution of my residuals. Again, uh, in a perfect world, this would be a wonderful normal curve. It looks like I've got kind of a normal curve here, but then kind of a positive skew on here, okay, uh, with a little bit of bump. Uh, again, this is going to be a function of problems with the distribution of my outcome variable. Um, so in general, we're saying uh, distribution is wonky, but probably not anything I want to necessarily interpret as clear evidence of nonlinearity or heteroscedasticity based on this. Now my PP plot is some that's showing some deviations from normality. I can see that in the histogram of my residuals uh, with the kernel density plot here, um, but it's just kind of this last tail, some positive skew uh, that I might want to take a look at. Okay. So this is the distribution of our residuals. I want to make note of uh, things there. Okay, so noted that. What we want to do now is take a look at our discrepancy values. Remember that the discrepancy uh, is going to be measured by our uh, the magnitude of our residuals. Uh, discrepancies are going to be large. Discrepancies are going to be indicated by a uh, large deviation between our predicted value and our actual observed value. So we're discrepancies are dealing with things in y space. Okay. So remember that I had uh, told Stata to save my external, externally studentized residuals. Um, this is my R student here. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to request a summary, a summary of my uh, externally studentized residuals. Remember that uh, these externally studentized residuals, these are going to follow a, generally follow a T distribution, uh, where uh, we're going to have n minus p, the number of predictors, minus 2 degrees of freedom. So if I go display 201 minus 3 predictors minus 2. So what these are is they give me 196 degrees of freedom. So what I could do if I wanted to is I could attach for each one of these studentized residuals a p-value telling me deviation from zero, right? So what we can do is we can basically treat these, particularly in a sample of this size, uh, with 196 degrees of freedom and a T distribution, you functionally got a Z uh, distribution anyway. Basically, we can treat this outcome as functionally Z scores. So um, we've got a low residual on the low end. Um, 
it's going to be sort of these negative values. These are going to be uh, cases where my observed uh, value is lower than what's expected or what's predicted by the model. My high values are going to be my observed uh, natural log of role functioning is going to be higher uh, than what was predicted by the model. Um, but everything in here is under 3. And again, if we're interpreting with a this in a large sample is kind of similar around standardized scores, it looks like we're not too concerned here probably with uh, uh, large discrepancies in this set. But what I could do is I could go through and I could sort T res, okay, that's right. Uh, and I could go through and I could look at sort of what values are high and what values are low and what values are high. Um, State also has this cool little uh, extremes command. If I go through extremes and I look, uh, tell it to give me the extreme value for my T res variable, and then also list uh, subject, my subject number. Check, what is it? Uh, I don't know, something weird went on there. Okay, so uh, what I see here, extremes is giving me my five smallest uh, residuals and corresponding subject number, my five highest residuals, corresponding subject number, this can be just a nice way to go through and summarize a nice tool in Stata to go through and take a look at stuff. Okay, so uh, it doesn't look like I have anything too terribly concerning in terms of uh, my residuals here, um, but just uh, for the heck of it, just to see, I'm going to graph, uh, give a box plot of my residuals. Looks like I've got, again, 269 is going to be my high value. So I've got some, a handful of cases that are falling above one and a half times the inner quartile range, uh, but not anything too terrible. Again, also I can ask for a histogram. Uh, those look pretty good. And so again, what we're concerned here is we want to, if we have very, very large residuals, we want to flag those. And so again, of a sample this size, we're looking at, very, uh, at residuals probably in excess of sort of the same uh, general standards we would use for um, our univariate outliers and z-scores and things like that. So here, things are looking pretty good. Okay, so Let's go through and get rid of those. So we're saying leverages or discre discrepancies are all right, um, but we also want to look at our leverages. If discrepancies are deviations in y space, leverages are uh, uh, discrepancies in x space, these are uh, weird combinations uh, among my predictors. Remember that the leverages are essentially our measure of multivariate outliers. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm going to summarize, uh, get a min-max really looking at my leverage values, but then I'm also going to include, uh, get descriptive statistics to remind me of uh, values for opiate use, pain, and PTSD, just so I can go through and, and take a look at some stuff here. So I'm going to run this. Okay, and so it looks like uh, here's my leverage value, my mean, min, max, and then for my predictor variables, uh, this is categorical, so about 50-50 split with opiate use, but a mean level of pain, mean level of PTSD uh, here. Okay, now remember that for our leverages uh, in Stata, these are just straight up leverages, um, and our leverage values in Stata are going to be equal to uh, the number of predictors, in this case 3, plus 1, divided by the sample size, 201, oops, there we go. So our uh, mean value for our leverage should be 0 0.0199, yep, so we got that, right? Um, and so what we're concerned about here in Stata, or excuse me, when we're looking at leverages uh, in Stata, is we're going to identify cases that are have leverages about three times the mean as potentially problematic. So I, I can do that one in my head, but just to show you. Let's display that times three. So we're going to look at be looking at uh, values of about 0.06 as 
things that are, are going to be notable in terms of leverages. Again, these are going to be cases with weird combinations of X values that are sort of falling outside of the range of expectation. So far, general, very general rule of thumb is about 0.06 uh, for high leverage values. We're going to see, okay, here it looks like we've got at least a couple uh, that are ex, uh, exceeding that. So we've got some high leverage values. Again, what we could do is we could sort our data, go through and take a look here. But what we can also do, again, is I'm just going to request extremes uh, for leverage. And then I'm going to request uh, that it also uh, provide uh, subject number uh, value for natural log of roll, opiate, PTSD, pain. And here I'm just going to request high. Okay. Before, our extremes we gave us low and high because we cared about sort of very high and very small ones. With leverages, we're only concerned with high values. I'm just going to go through and I'm going to run this. Okay. And so this is going to give me my highest my three, or excuse me, my five highest leverage values. And it looks like if our cut point, oops, uh, or my general rule of thumb is about 0.06, it looks like I've got two leverage values here that are above that level. Now, these are just observation numbers. This is where they're falling in this, right? Uh, but I also told, stated, uh, give me subject number, uh, the role functioning uh, value for these ca cases, opiate use, pain, PTSD. So if I'm looking at, extend this up a little bit. Um, if I'm looking at this first high leverage value, so I've got a, a leverage value, participant number 310, uh, with a leverage value of 0.062, uh, which is going to be considered fairly high within these data. And I go through and I take a look. So this is someone who's not using opiate use whose pain level is 0.33, but the mean of pain is 4 with a standard deviation of 1. That's an incredibly low pain score. Uh, their PTSD score is 79 and average is 50. So this is someone who has a high level of pain, or excuse me, a high level of PTSD combined with a low level of pain. Um, and so that is within this set is strange. Um, with what's going on. Uh, same thing here if we take a look at uh, case number 221, second highest uh, leverage value. Um, again, someone who's not taking opiates. Uh, pain level looks to be about uh, at the mean level, uh, but an extremely high PTSD score, uh, double the average here. Um, so we've got some issues here. So just wanting to do this to go through and try and get a sense for what's going on um, with what's causing these uh, cases to maybe be registered as multivariate, potential multivariate outliers. Um, but remember that uh, this rule of thumb should be used very, very sort of carefully and not at all seriously. What we want to do is I want to go through and I want to graph out uh, just in a box plot these leverage values um, uh, labeled by subject, just so I can kind of see what this is looking like. So again, uh, what we're seeing is kind of a continuous uh, uh, distribution of leverage values up here at 310, 221, are looking like maybe they're potentially high that we might want to take a little bit uh, more of a look at um, within this thing. So, um, what we're going to do here, and again, the graph is more important here than the actual uh, threshold, uh, but it, says, it seems like maybe we'll take a look at 310 and 221. Okay, So what I'm going to do, uh, oh, and we can also take a look at, actually, I'm going to change that to bin 17. All right, so I'm going to request a histogram of my leverages from those. Okay. So we're seeing here, these are these ones that are kind of hanging out here. We've got a couple at that 0.06 level. Um, and so these are the cases that we're going to take a look at. All right. So uh, we've kind of gotten an idea with this, what might be contributing to uh, sort of the weirdness of these variables. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through, run a form, a little bit former test. Remember, we uh, hijacked this from Tabachnik and Fidel. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm going to sort my leverages.
I'm going to sort my leverages. So my leverages here. All right. So these are the two cases that I wanted to take a look at. Uh, and again, this is case 221 and 310. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create two variables. Uh, I'm going to call them MV1 and MV2. And I'm going to say generate MV1 is equal to 0, MV2 is equal to 0. So this is just going to create two variables that are zeros. Okay, Just to call them as zeros. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to add for my first high leverage point. I'm going to say this is 1. Okay, and My second high leverage point, this is 1. So essentially what we've done is we've created two variables that have nothing but zeros except for just a one value to mark the two cases that we've identified as uh, potential uh, multivariate outliers. Okay, And then, remember, what we're going to do is I'm going to regress uh, MV1, so this is an outcome, onto my three predictors. Okay, Now this isn't a regression model that we would ever actually run and report. But what it does is it's a nice little hack to go through and try and get a sense for what specific variables of opiate use, pain, and PTSD are creating, uh, causing this to register as a multivariate outlier. So if I run this, I see that I've got here, looks like low levels of pain is the primary, th primary thing causing this case to register as problematic with some evidence of a com combination of a high PTSD score. And that's kind of what we saw here. We've got someone with a, uh, a pain score that's falling far below the mean level of the sample combined with a PTSD score that's pretty high. Um, and so it looks like for case number uh, 310, the reason this is registering as a high level uh, or as a high leverage value is a combination of uh, pain and PTSD, low pain and high PTSD, which is not apparently typical in our sample. Okay, we can do the same thing. We can regress uh, MV2. This is a uh, indicator variable that's identifying case number 221. Uh, regress that onto opiate use, pain, and PTSD. Go through, take a look here. And it looks like the primary issue causing this to register as a high leverage is simply just that extraordinarily high PTSD value, right? Again, uh, if we go up and take a look, this is someone with a PTSD score in case 221 of 111 when the mean is 51, standard deviation of 20. So that's an incredibly high score there. And so we would say case... 221 is uh, primarily being that high leverage value is primarily being driven by um, a high high levels of PTSD uh, within the context of the model. Okay, so we'd want to note both of those in our screening as potential issues with multivariate outliers. We want to talk a little bit about those. Okay. Um. Finally, what we're going to do here is we're going to go through and take a look at influence. Remember that influence is going to be a combination of our discrepancy and our leverage values. Now, a case can have a high discrepancy uh, and not necessarily impact the solution. It can have a high leverage value, not necessarily uh, impact the solution. Uh, but if we start mixing those two things together, high leverages, high uh, discrepancies, we can start to have a bigger impact on our model. Okay. And remember that Cook's D is uh, our uh, main measure of influence that we're going to take a look at. Again, we uh, asked to save that as Cook's. And so what I'm going to do is I am going to summarize my Cook's value. Okay, this is just going to take a look at my min and my max on my Cook's. And remember uh, that our general sort of rule of thumb estimate for Cook's is going to be display. Oops. Is going to be 4 divided by my sample, which is 201, minus my number of predictors, minus 1. Okay. So what I'm going to look at is maybe something to potentially continue to look into is going to be a Cook's value that's above 0.20. Okay. Now, if I look at my Cook's value, 
or at my max, I got a value of 0.05. That's a lot. If I go through and I go through and I sort folks and look at my data, I'm going to see that I have a whole lot of cases right here. I G sort. I'm going to do G sort root can reverse. So G sort negative cooks is just going to uh, uh, sort this in descending order. So everything's up near the top. Okay. Um, and so, boy, if 0 .20, 0 020 is my cut point, boy, I've got 14 cases that are all registering as something that we might uh, consider high levels of, of influence, right? Now, we're obviously not going to throw out 14 cases indiscriminately, uh, and this is where your plots start to, become, start to become important. So more so than just looking at what exceeds a cut point, what are the graphically, what do these look at? or look like. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to request extremes to give me cooks, subject, and just the high values. So in my, these are my five highest cooks, 130, 402, 185, 116, uh, 330, right? Um, so again, these are all values that are going to be high, but so we've got a lot of them there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort uh, by cooks. We have to go through and we need to uh, resort this. And then what I'm going to ask, say, to give me is a drop line plot. Okay. Uh, what this is going to do is I'm going to uh, drop line cooks uh, by uh, subject, um, label this. Okay. And what I'm looking for is really high values. All right. Um, I could also request a, a block box plot of this. I just kind of like this drop line plot uh, for these. It's kind of cool. And so we can see that 130 is really high, but 116, 185, 330, 402 are all big. Right? But if we shave those off, then these ones are going to be large. So we've got some leverage values that are all kind of up here. It makes it hard to know which one of these might be the ones that we should be concerned about, right? So we would maybe note uh, in our screening that we've got a total of 14 cases that are very, very high in terms of, in, or that are, would be considered high in terms of uh, normal benchmarks for influence, uh, 130, 116. These ones, maybe we'd skim these off and identify these as particularly problematic. But the other thing that we can do uh, is we can start running combination plots. Now this is where state is really nice. We can run some pretty cool plots pretty easily. Uh, that can give us quite a bit of information. Um, what we've got here is a leverage by our uh, uh, our leverage by our squared residual. Is that right? Uh, plot here, uh, and we talked about this in class a little bit. If I go through and I run this, and that doesn't something went screwy here. Um, all right. Actually, watch this. We go clear. So we just got rid of all that data. It's like, oh no, all that work we put in is all gone. Um, actually, not really. So we can just go through and re-pull up our data. And then if we go back up to the top and we generate our role functioning variable, right? So we got the natural log of role functioning. And then we go back through and we run all our residual statistics. Just run all of those. That's looking good. And now if we go back down through and run this combination plot. There we go. Okay. So again, uh, I'm not sure what happened there, but uh, a good, good, good uh, pitch for having a strong do file where even if something gets screwed up, you can go back through and rerun everything just like that. So remember, uh, remember here uh, with our normalized square residual by our leverages, we're looking for stuff up here as being particularly problematic in influencing uh, my solution. And really, we don't have any cases up here in this corner. So our squared residuals, uh, squared normalized residual by leverages, this isn't looking too bad. So I don't know that I'm too worried about this. 
But then I also, uh, again, in Stata can run uh, this uh, other combination plot uh, looking at my studentized residuals by my leverages. Uh, but then here what we're going to do uh, is we're going to run this uh, command. And what it's going to do is it's going to give me this. And so we're going to be plotting, so taking kind of this thing and swipping around, putting leverages on the X and residuals on the Y. So just kind of flipping the axis here. But what's nice about this is it's going to give us uh, the size of these circles are going to be proportional to the size of your Cook's D or your influence uh, uh, statistic. So here, again, what we're looking for is cases up here in the upper right hand or upper right hand corner and the lower right hand corner. So based on our combination plot, it looks like case number 130 might be potentially problematic. Uh, in case number 116, these were both cases that got flagged for having um, high Cook's Ds. These are kind of out there, but really what we're looking at, so this is going to be uh, case 130. This has a high leverage value, okay? So it's uh, this is a case that's registering as a, as a potential strange case in terms of Xs uh, in addition to... Uh, having a very low residual, so we missed our prediction. Uh, this is a case uh, that's going to be considerably lower than what was predicted by the model. Up here, we've got a high residual, something, a case that was predicted to be much higher than it is. Um, excuse me, the observed value is uh, larger than it was. Or the, excuse me, the observed value is much larger than the predicted value, and it's got a high D value as well. So these might be two cases that we would take a look at, although it's, you know, if something was way up here, way down there, that might be uh, a little bit more compelling, okay? So we're going to go through, we're going to take a look and sort of make sure that we're writing all this stuff down. Um, but that is going to go through, once we've kind of got a summary of that, that's going to uh, take care of our, um, uh, take care of our residual stuff, right? So the last thing that we want to do here is take a look at and start thinking about collinearity, okay? So what we're going to do uh, is we want to make sure that we don't have massively huge correlations uh, among our predictors primarily, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a uh, pairwise correlation between uh, natural log roll functioning, opiate use pain, and PTSD. I'm going to run that. Okay, and this is just a, a correlation uh, matrix here, right? So it looks like we've got a pretty strong correlation between pain and role functioning. As role function increases, uh, pain goes down, or as pain goes up, role functioning decreases. So we've got a pretty strong correlation there. But between our predictors, nothing super strong. The highest correlation we've got is between opiate use and pain, uh, which makes some sense. Um, but nothing that looks uh, concerning in terms of high correlations between variables, right? Um, again, we're talking about things that start getting up 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, stuff like that. So um, bivariate relations look okay. But remember, we can have combinations, right, of variables that produce collinearity. So what I'm going to do is what we need to have is we need to run... Now... Stata still has this regression run as its last sort of uh, main estimation command. Uh, but if we run that, we didn't need to, it was already in there. But then if we hit just run VIF, this is going to give me variance inflation factor and my tolerance. One divided by VIF is my tolerance. Remember that uh, VIFs that we're going to be concerned about is anything that starts to incur 10, if anything gets even in the uh, so the galaxy range of 10, you should be concerned. But these are all right around 1, so no concerns there. Remember that uh, tolerance or 1 divided by your variance inflation factor, uh, looking at uh, things that are about 0.1. Again, if it's anywhere even in the vicinity or you have even talked about getting down that low, you should be concerned. But these are all reasonable, so that looks good. And then if there were problems or we saw things that we're looking problematic with uh, our VIF or our tolerance. We could uh, run uh, cold IAG2. This is uh, collinearity diagnostics. Um, again, remember what we're looking at is index, um, condition index, 
above 30 uh, with variance proportions uh, above 0.5. So there's nothing obviously going on in there. Um, this is going to be fine. So no problems with collinearity. Okay. So we've got most of the stuff going on here. A couple other things within Stata. Uh, just to finish up, just want to show you one thing that's really nice about this program is the ability to attach notes to your set. So let's say we went through and we screened all this. And based on our last combination plot, let's say we really think that case number 130 and 116 are two cases that we might want to take a look at, right? Uh, what I can do, because I've done this right now, but I'm going to forget in like two seconds, I can go through and tell say to, to note screening identified case uh, number 130 uh, and possibly 116 is influential, right? So if I go through and I set this, uh, and what you can do is you can attach a note, right? And so what I might do is just note this in the command line to say note, we can run it from this index, but then I'm just saying note, screen identified as influential, right? And what it is, is it attaches a note to the data set. And I can say note, uh, remember that I trans formed rule functioning, okay? So I can go through and I can do that. Later on, when I go through uh, and I want to say, oh, what did I do? Or did I make any notes to this? I can just type in notes and it'll pull it up. It says screening identified 130 and possibly 116 is uh, influential. And then remember that it transformed, right? So it'll go through and pull up your notes. This is super, super helpful. So if you save this data set, and you pull it up uh, two weeks from now, hit notes, it's going to pull up all the stuff that you wanted to remind yourself of. Uh, this is very, very handy. Um, do this. Other thing you can do, so this is the same note, note screen identified, uh, 130 and possibly 116 is influential. Here I ended up, I put a TS on the end. This is nice. What this will do is it'll timestamp this. So now if I go notes, it'll say, okay, screen identified 130 and 116 is influential, 25th of March, it's 1141 at night, so just, I guess, so you know when I'm making this, uh, so it'll go through and timestamp that, uh, that's super nice, uh, what I can do is if I don't want notes, if I make a mistake, so I'm going to say note drop within the data set, uh, number two, so if I want to get rid of this one, remember that I transform rule functioning, if I want to get rid of that, we'll do that, now if I write notes, this puts one and three. But you can see two was deleted there. Okay. Um, note that I can also attach a variable. So these are just attaching notes to the data set overall. What I can do is I can detach a data set, uh, a note specifically to a variable. So what I've done is I've said note role functioning. Okay. So that I'm attaching a note specifically to the variable role functioning. I'm saying variables are ordinal and potentially problematic. I run that. Okay. If I hit notes for role functioning, hey, future Josh, variable is ordinal, potentially problematic. Just a really nice way to go through and, and keep things uh, in there. I can also just say notes for role functioning. If I don't want all my notes, just one uh, for one variable role functioning there. So just some things that you can go through and use the system. Uh, and then when you save your data set here, it'll save those notes so that everything comes up next time you want to use it. Okay. So last thing I want to do before we uh, let you go is show you now what I could do if I really thought cases 130 and 116 were problematic. I could go through and I could sort this um, and go through and find the cases and delete them. Um, but then I've changed my data set. Uh, Stata makes it pretty easy to go through and, and run some stuff. What I can do is I can go through and compare model with those cases and a model without those cases. What I'm going to do here is what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell Stata to quietly regress uh, the natural log of role functioning on opiate pain and PTSD. This is the model just with the full set that we've used. But when I say quietly, it just Stata does this in the background, doesn't give me any output. But it just did that and it saved uh, that uh, in the in the memory. So that uh, model is what it's currently got in the memory. And then what I'm going to do with this estimates command, I'm just going to store the estimates from that model 
and we're going to call that base. Okay. So what I've done is I've gone through and I've run a model and then I've stored that model in the memory at under the name base. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to run another one. And this I'm going to say quietly regress natural role functioning of opiate use, pain, and PTSD. So the same model I did here, but if not enlist that exclamation point means not in Stata, not enlist if the subject is 116 and 130. So essentially what I'm saying is run my model, run regress role functioning on opiate pain and PTSD unless uh, the participant number is 116 uh, and 130, then kick those people out. So I can go through and I can do that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to estimate, uh, store these estimates as deleted to. Okay. And so these aren't, again, because I did this quietly, nothing's going on in my output uh, window here. But then what I can do is I can say, uh, run estimates and create a table for base, which is this model, and deleted to, this is just telling it to drop, drop a constant, this is decimals for your thing, uh, putting uh, significance uh, asterisks on the things, requesting your sample size in this. But essentially what we can do is have uh, Stata create a table for me, and so what I can do is I can say, boy, I think case 113, or excuse me, 116 and 130 are problematic. Okay? Um, but what I've got is this is my unstandardized coefficients for opioid use, pain, and PTSD in the base model. This is with all 201 people. My R squared for this is 381. If I go through and I kick out those two people, uh, 18, uh, 116 and 130, in my deleted two, functionally, my opiate use coefficient hasn't changed. Uh, only minor changes in my coefficient for pain. Only minor co changes in my coefficients for PTSD. There's some minor changes in my R squared value, but functionally, it's not causing any problems there. So even though I thought that maybe 116 and 130 were problematic, when I actually run my model with and without it, it really doesn't make any functional difference, right? So this is just a nice way we can go through in Stata and put together a quick little table. And again, uh, this might seem like a lot of stuff, but once you've gone through and you've created this do file, then doing it for other files, you just is basically changing around variable names and stuff like that. It makes it pretty easy and straightforward. Okay, so that takes us through the screening. Um, if we go through and thinking about how do we write all this up, because we just went through a lot of stuff. Okay. At the end of your file, um, again, uh, basically running through our standard protocol here in terms of screening, um, accuracy and plausibility, no problematic values, missing values, no missing values for our target variables. We've got a full sample of 201 here. We're looking at uh, univariate distribution, skew, kurtosis for pain and PTSD are looking fine. Talk about histograms and box plots, histograms and box plots. Those are all pretty much okay, right? Um, but then we're indicated saying role functioning indicates clear violations of normality, skew and kurtosis values. We say histogram re reveals role functioning as an ordinal variable, taking all values of 0, 25, 50, 75, 100. Talking about sort of uh, what's going on in our plots saying we uh, applied natural log, uh, brought the skew and kurtosis within reasonable values. Um, histogram still is non-normal, but it's sort of better than it was. Uh, and then our uh, dichotomous variable there, uh, balanced opiate use. Okay, so this is just getting our univariate distributions in. Univariate outliers or extreme values, nothing looking uh, big here. Uh, bivariate associations, linearity, homoscedasticity, no evidence of nonlinearity in my box, uh, my matrix plot. Uh, not too much evidence of heteroscedasticity among my continuous variables. So things are looking good there. Residual distributions. Uh, saying that remember this is when I was looking at my uh, my residuals. Look approximately normal based on my uh, normal probability plot, uh, my PP plot there, uh, and the histogram slight positive skew suggesting that my observed scores are larger than what's predicted by the model, sort of in general. Um, my residual by fitted, no obvious nonlinearities. Um, not a lot of strong heteroscedasticity, but again, we're talking about that ordinal dependent variable starts to 
complicate sort of a good read on that uh, on that residual plot. Um, discrepancies um, again, these were our uh, studentized externally studentized residuals. Those are looking fine. Histogram and box plot, no real problematic uh, cases with respect to uh, predicted values. Leverages, cases 221 and 310, exceeding uh, three times our expected value. You can see here as a reference what our expected value was. Histograms, box plots, uh, identify these cases on a continuous distribution. Uh, and here, very, very important, we're saying what caused these two cases to be uh, register as high leverage values. Always want to explore those, right? Uh, and then we're saying while they exceed uh, benchmarks, determined by primary, primarily by high low scores on a single var variable, were attained, but we're going to monitor these values. Okay. Um, 310 was one of the ones we uh, included and we looked at without, didn't change the model a whole lot when we kicked it out, so we're probably not going to be too concerned there. Um, influence. Uh, 14 cases exceeded benchmark for potential inquiry. Drop plot identified these two as the most influential cases in the model. Um, so some things we want to go through and, and maybe take a look at, but uh, just kind of noting it there. Multicollinearity, uh, bivariate correlations are fine. Uh, VIF is fine, so no concerns there. And so then finishing up with some recommendations, right? So uh, predictors are okay. Row functioning is ordinal. It's problematic, right? Uh, natural log transform improves it, but I still have a level of, measure, level of measurement problem here with my outcome. Um, residual plots, possible positive skew, not severe, um, but remember skew can suppress uh, standard errors, so maybe take a note of that. Uh, number of cases identified for further in, uh, investigation based on uh, discrepancy leverage and influence, and no major concerns, so we didn't see anything that was way sit on any of those sitting way far apart from the rest of the distributions, right? There wasn't anything that was setting super far out there. We say we might wish to explore cases to determine specific impacts on the model. We did that a little bit. It turned out to be okay. okay? So uh, despite reasonable adherence, uh, measurement of role function is a discrete ordinal variable. continues to be problematic. That's really the takeaway from this. Uh, and really some alternative models that uh, do a better job of accounting for categorical measurement, uh, primarily some sort of ordinal regression, probably going to be better. Okay. So that was a lot. Thanks for bearing with me. Apologize for the sound on this, um, but there's just a lot to go through, work through, think about with these, um, but always uh, want to go through, uh, and it's nice to make sure that we've taken a look, know our data inside and out, and can identify any problems there. So um, that's that. Let me know if you have any questions, but this should set you up uh, with a pretty good template for running through and doing this. The first one will be tricky. The ones after that will be easier. So good luck. Let me know if you run into any difficulties.